the Lord, everybody. Could we stand? And I belong. Started. It's our Bible lesson. And, uh, they're going to be coming in to start the lesson. So before they come, this gives us a chance to pray and to sing a little bit. And uh, anybody love singing to the Lord and lifting your voice to the Lord? And we good to see each of you. Thank you for being here. Let's pray together, shall we? And let's lift our hands and our hearts and let's invite the presence of God here today. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now, Lord, for this special day. Thank you for our mothers. Thank you for each and every one, Lord, that gathers into the house of God. Lord, these are very serious times and the house of the Lord is more important than it's ever been. It's important to our hearts. Lord, thank you for this morning Bible lesson and our children children that are gathering in class. I pray for them. I pray for every teacher, Lord, whatever burden they faced. And I know the enemy would fight and try to discourage, but thank you for victories and thank you for zealous and joyful teachers. Thank you for the anointing. Lord, we feel your touch right now. And Lord, we give you praise as we worship you and as Brother French teaches the word of God today. Let it touch our hearts and stir us in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. And everyone said, amen. We're going to sing uh, Solid Rock. And <clears throat> I, I've been doing, I did a conference this week in uh, a few states over from here. And I really, really <laughs> lost, just about lost my voice. But, uh, but, but it doesn't matter. I don't sing well anyway. So you just, you just have to uh, join me. And we'll give it a try. They're going to give us a little bit of help. And, and we'll sing the Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the Son.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. If you have your Bibles, just pull them close and uh, we're going to get into our, our Mother's Day lesson. And I do want to say Happy Mother's Day uh, to all the ladies out there. And um, I want to say a very special Happy Mother's Day. I don't see her yet. I'm sure she's in the building. But uh, to my mother, our first lady, and I, I can truly say, uh, it, you know, trying to put it into words is difficult sometimes, but I really do just have the best mom. I'm, I'm sorry for the rest of y'all, but I just have the best mom, and I appreciate her very, very much. All the sacrifices that she made for us as children and even as adults, uh, she has given her life to be uh, a woman of God and a mother who loves her family and raises a godly family. And I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. I really, I really do. And the fact that she's a great cook is wonderful as well. I appreciate that. And I also want to give honor to my wife, who is a tremendous mother figure to Talmadge and Julia. She loves them with all of her heart, and she has transformed our home. And I am so thankful that she loves the Lord. She loves to worship. She loves the things of God. She loves the people of God. And I appreciate how much she enjoys talking because that makes it where I don't have to talk as much. And so we have a perfect relationship. It's, you know, we, can be a, we can go to a conference somewhere and uh, she can do the talking and I can just kind of be me and I thank God for it. So I love you very much and I appreciate you. And all of you, we love you, all you mothers and mother figures out there. Uh, some of the best mothers in the world are not... Uh, they didn't give birth to the children that they raised. Amen? Some of the best mothers in the world did not give birth to the children they raised, but they are tremendous mothers in their actions, and I give honor to all of you today, and grandmothers as well. Aren't you thankful for grandmothers and, and um, that keep us all that keep us all feeling loved and also keep us on the right track. All right, I want to uh, talk to you about what the Bible says about being a godly woman. What the Bible says about being a godly woman. I thought this would be a good subject for Mother's Day and I hope I can get all the way through it, but the Bible has a lot to say about womanhood and, and motherhood, but specifically womanhood. And it's very difficult to be a godly mother if you're not a godly woman, amen? So uh, if we start with being a godly woman, then it's natural that you become a godly mother. But I did want to share this story with you that I read the other day. And after teasing pastor and bishop about uh, the Reader's Digest, I found this story in the Reader's Digest. So here I am, uh, listed among all the preachers that have found uh, illustrations and stories out of the Reader's Digest. But I love stories about mothers. I could tell you stories about my mother, but I want her to love me today. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna share too many of those. But I was reading a story that reminded me of a few things that have <laughs> happened with my own dear mother over the years. And there was a, a woman, she took a CPR class, and she... Uh, was really proud of, of how she had learned to do CPR. And she was in the mall with her daughter, and they saw a man on the ground laying there, and uh, I mean, he, was having, he was having some trouble. And so there were people standing over, and they looked concerned. And so the mother, just having learned CPR, she rushed over there, and she was getting down on the ground next to the man, getting ready to save his life. And all of a sudden, she was lifted up by the shoulders, and a police officer said, ma'am, we're going to need you to get out of the way. We're trying to arrest this man. Which, it reminds me of something uh, that my mother has done. Also, there was a time, since pastor's not in here, it's not, it's not Father's Day, so I can tell this story. One time, dad was, uh, and mom were <laughs> at the bank. Oh, I'm going to be in so much trouble, but he's not in here, so it's okay. This was many years ago when I was a kid, they went to the bank and they saw a man go walking into the bank with a gun, and they saw the metal glint off the gun, and so pastor called the police and the police, this is not an exaggeration, the police showed, a SWAT team showed up. 
within five minutes, they were just, this was a downtown bank. And they rushed in, they surrounded the place, they found, they found the man and uh, they brought him outside and they said, Pastor French, is, is this the man that you were talking about? And he said, yes, that's the one, he had a gun. And they, they pulled out this, uh, this shiny comb And they said, is this the gun you're talking about? <laughs> so he had seen the sun glinting off a, a metal comb, and he thought it was a gun. So anyway, I'm in trouble for the rest of the week. God bless you. Good night. You'll have a new associate pastor next week. But <laughs> So godly women, godly women have, are, are, are subject today, and we want to talk about what the Bible says about it. Not just our opinions, but what the Bible says about it. So I'm gonna take you to the next slide. And if you have your Bible, I wanna direct your attention to Titus chapter two. Titus chapter two, verses two through four. This is a wonderful passage of scripture. And it says this, that the aged men be sober. Everyone said sober. Grave, temperate, sound in faith, In charity, in patience. That's talking about men. Now, by the way, I do want to just direct your attention and tell you that the word sober there, everyone said sober, does literally mean to abstain from alcohol. Everybody okay? Sometimes we we think this means something else. It does, of course, mean Uh, to be moderate and temperate, but how many notice that it says sober, grave, and then temperate is a whole nother word there. So we have the word sober, and the literal translation of that word is to abstain from alcohol. How many believe that Christians should still abstain from alcohol in all of its various forms? And by the way, in Bible days, they didn't have anywhere near the kind of alcohol that we have exposure to today they didn't they had some even the hardest liquor in bible days would be nothing compared to the kind of liquor that people are are drinking today so we should be sober amen grave temperate sound and faith and charity and patient and then in verse three it switches and it says and the aged women likewise everyone said likewise so that means that everything we just said about the men also pertains to the aged women, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Praise the Lord. How many see that word there? That that they in their behavior conduct themselves in a way that becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine. This is a, this is a, some people say, well, much wine, does that mean that we can have a little wine? And I refer you right back to uh, that word sober that means to abstain from alcohol. This was just an expression that meant do not be a drinker of alcohol. Teachers of good things. And this is verse four, and I think this is very important, and I think many People and churches have lost sight of this. Verse four, that they may teach the young women to be what? Sober. Here's that word again, to be sober, to love their husbands. So that's the second thing they need to be teaching young women. Did you know and <laughs> that sometimes, uh, sometimes husbands are hard to love? And the women got quiet, but I know that you feel the Holy Ghost right now. Sometimes husbands are hard to love. And, and aged women understand, and I'm using the Bible word, okay? Aged, I'm sorry if that's offensive, but aged women understand that love is more than a feeling. Amen? Love is more than just uh, losing your breath for a second or goosebumps or an experience. Love is a commitment of the heart. Love is a spiritual endeavor. Love is a decision that you make every single morning. Every morning, husbands and wives wake up and decide, I'm going to love my spouse today. 
and sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's a little harder. But aged women, one of the things that aged women need to teach the younger women is how to love their husbands in all ways, how, not just how to be a good wife, but how to love, how to stay in love, how to operate in love, how to think about love, how to be sober, how to stay away from addiction, how to stay away from things that would, would alter you or distract you. And then finally, I love this last line, and how to what? Love their children. I can testify here I have been giving honor to my mother, but my mother would be the first to tell you and me and all of my brothers would be the first to admit that we were very unlovable at times. There were times when, when my mother had to make a decision to love her boys because even in parenting, Love is not always just that tender moment when you, you bring them home from the hospital and oh, it's so Gucci goo, it's beautiful and wonderful. No, no, because, because boys turn into great big, silly, ridiculous, smelly teenagers. And my poor mom, who desperately wanted to have a girl, had three boys. And my mother is probably the most feminine, women that you'll ever meet and she just wanted one girl to be able to be girly with and uh and instead she got three boys who are who when they turned into teenagers were all the obnoxious things that you expect boys to be at teenage years but she loved her children and she'll tell you today she she was able to love as a mother because she had a mother who taught her how to love. Taught her how to love her children. This is so important. This is, this is not something, I've often heard people say, parenting and marriage, all of these things, there's, there's no, you, you don't get a practice round with parenting. It's not like you, uh, it's just one day you have children and then all of these things are changing in your life. And, and what we need is more than just books and seminars. All of those things are helpful. But if godly women, if godly elders reach out to young women and offer them encouragement and support and teach them and train them how to do these things well. This is how God intended for things to be passed along in the kingdom of God, from one mother to another mother, from one elder to a younger lady. How many believe this is God's plan for the church? God wants elders to take younger women under their wing. And by the way, we, we live, and I, I wish that this wasn't so, but it, it just is. We live in a culture even in my own life, but you see in this church and every church you go to now, it's not like it was in, in decades past where you have multi-generational families with a mother and a grandmother in church and then children and great-grandchildren in church. Oftentimes when people come to the Lord and get in church, many times they have no family members at all that serve the Lord. And so they desperately need someone to reach out to them and say, I want you to, you're a part of my family now because we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so now I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you under my wing like I would a daughter or a granddaughter. And I'm going to train you in some things. And I'm going to do it lovingly. I'm not going to lord over you. I'm not going to put guilt trips on you. But I'm going to love you and train you how to do things properly and how to be a good godly woman. Don't you think that'd be a blessing to people if we pull them under our wing? And this really is God's plan, by the way. You know, a pastor and what I'm doing right now, we can only do so much teaching on these kinds of things. And and even now, I'm teaching women, and there's men in here, and men are having to sit through a lesson on how to be a godly woman. And, and so, this can only be done so much from a pulpit and from a teaching perspective. Many of these things, much of holiness, by the way, God intended for it to be taught privately between godly saints and godly younger saints. And then the pulpit affirms those things when and where possible. This is the plan of God. So godly women practice 
and teach self-control. Everyone said self-control. Self-control. God has called every single woman, really every child of God, but everyone in this room is called to be a teacher. Everybody okay? Everyone here is called to be a teacher. I know we don't think that way. That doesn't mean you're called to get up behind a pulpit or have a microphone, but you are called to teach someone the things of God, holiness and the ways of God privately. This is how God wants us to maintain standards and holiness within the church. So that's Titus 2, 2 through 4. Okay, I'm going to take you to the next slide, and I want us to look at Proverbs 31, 27. We'll look at a couple scriptures from Proverbs 31, because of course we know that Proverbs 31, that entire chapter, is the description of what the Bible considers to be an ideal godly wife, ideal godly mother. We could have just taught directly from Proverbs 31, but I didn't want to just do that. But we are going to look at at this particular one. A godly woman cares for her household, her household. Proverbs 31, 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. In other words, she's not lazy about her household. This doesn't just mean, by the way, that, that a wife and a mother looks to keeping the house clean. Some people have <laughs> used this scripture to say she looketh well and she, she cleans the house. You know, it is good to have a clean house and that's a good thing, but that's not specifically what this scripture is talking about. This scripture is talking about the ways of the household. She's paying attention to the needs of her children. She's paying attention to the needs of her husband. She's paying attention to the needs of the finances. She's paying attention to uh, having hospitality in the home. She's looking to bring joy into the home. She's finding ways to alleviate pressure. I can tell you right now, and I, I hold my mother up to the standard because she's my mother. You can hold your mother up to the standard. But I look at my mother, and in our household, even today, with kids grown and moved out and grandkids, my mother is the one who is always looking to make sure that everyone is okay. She's looking to make sure that everyone's communicating and everybody's where they ought to be and everybody's doing fine and she's trying to keep, she's pulling that together. She's looking to the ways of her household, whatever that means. And so a godly woman cares for her household. In other words, the household, the family, this is her priority. It's a husband's priority, but for a woman, it's, in a, it's from a different perspective because women are naturally peacemakers. Women, they ought to be anyway. Women are naturally caregivers, and they have instincts that men don't necessarily have in these areas. And so women are powerful in keeping the household together. They're powerful in keeping the household happy. And when they're a godly woman, they can do this with the leading and the guiding of the spirit. Everyone said the spirit. And this often means that a godly mother and wife will have discernment. Uh, I can remember many times in my life where my mother spent some time in a prayer room and then she came out and she mysteriously knew something about my life that there was no way for her to know except that God (laughs) had told her and that is, that is looking to the ways of the household. Looking to the ways of the household. A godly mother does this. A godly woman does this. Okay, next slide. And I want to look at Ephesians 2. If you have your Bible, go to Ephesians 2, verse 22 and 23. A godly woman submits to a godly husband. Now, if you missed last Wednesday night, we talked about why Satan hates spiritual coverings or spiritual authority of any kind. And for a more in-depth understanding of, of what it means to, 
to be a wife or a husband and what that authority looks like, you really should go back and look up that lesson on the live stream or the podcast or, or get the CD from Brother Pinder because it will help you. I don't have time to go into all of the nuances of, of what it means to, for a wife to submit and be under the covering of a husband and what that means for a husband as well. We also talked about how uh, to have a covering you, or an authority in your life. It's an authority in the kingdom of God. It's an authority that you choose. So when it comes to God, God doesn't force us to have allegiance to him in this world. How many understand that to be? You're not here today because God woke you up and forced you to come to church today. God isn't going to force you to worship. You could sit through this entire service on your hands. You could frown. You could glare. You could fold your arms. God will never force you to worship him. God will never force you to pay tithes or give or to be generous. God will never make you do these things. We become willing servants to the Lord. We do this willingly. And so a pastor has authority that comes directly from God. He's God's under shepherd. But in the same way that God isn't going to force his authority over you, a pastor can't force his authority on you either. You're not here today because your pastor called you this morning and said, if you're not here, I'm going to be at your house at 3 o'clock today. You came to church and you hear the preaching and you, and you listen to the wisdom and instruction and guidance of a pastor according to your own desire to be submitted. When you get married, ladies, men, you decide who you're going to marry. And a, and a godly woman makes the decision to marry a godly man, and when she does so, she says, I am going to submit in the godly sense to the authority of my husband. I'm going to allow him to have a spiritual covering in my home. I'm going to love him. And then a man is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. So verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. So godly women submit to godly husbands. Now, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, but obviously, uh, and when it comes to secular authority, we don't really have a say over whether or not we're going to be obedient to secular authority. I can say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed and I'm going to drive 120 miles an hour, but secular authority will take dominion over me, right? Eventually, secular authority will, will actually take measures against me. Uh, I can say that, uh, you know, I'm not going to pay my taxes, for example. But secular authority will come in and, and they'll take your taxes. Not only will they take your taxes, they might even throw you in jail if, if things are bad enough. Because secular authority, and we don't really get to say, you might say, well, it, it's a democracy and we get to vote. But the reality is, we understand, very rarely do we get what we vote for. And even when we vote, there's things happening that are out of our control. And then we vote for people who don't do things that we thought they were going to do. How many have ever had someone you voted for that, may, that kept every promise? Nobody. It's never happened. And so when it comes to secular authority, we have to be obedient. Jesus said, they, they tried to trick him. Remember this? He was teaching and they came to him and they had some, some money and it had a, a coin with a picture of Caesar on it and they said, um, you know, we just want to know. We're Jews and we're basically being held captive here in Rome. Should we be paying our taxes to Caesar? And they knew this was a tricky question because they knew the Jews did not want to have to pay taxes to Rome. 
But they also knew that if Jesus said not to pay taxes, that this would offend Rome, and now he could become an enemy of the state. And so Jesus very wisely said, show me the coin. And he said, whose picture is on the coin? And they said, well, it's Caesar Augustus. And he said, oh, well, that answers the question. Give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and give unto God that which is God's. And over and over in scripture, even Paul talked about submitting to godly authority. And the Bible makes it clear that it's the Lord who raises up kings and brings them down. It's the Lord who raises up kingdoms and brings them down. However, we also know from scripture that if if an earthly king or an earthly president tells us that we cannot pray, this happened to Daniel that we cannot pray. In this situation, if an earthly authority tells us to disobey godly authority, then we must disobey the earthly authority. Everybody okay? Now, we may not like every law or every rule, but we follow them as long as we can do them in good conscience without violating the word and the law of God. But the moment uh, someone tells me that you cannot go to church, you can't worship, you can't pray, you can't live a lifestyle that's godly, you can't talk, you can't speak the name of Jesus in public, for example. If they ever say you can't speak the name of Jesus ever in public, I'll be in jail very quickly because I'm gonna speak the name of Jesus in public if that's, if that's what God calls me to do. And so we disobey earthly authority in that way. It's the same with parents, for example. God tells us to honor our father and our mother, right? God tells us to obey our parents. However, if our parents tell us to go beat someone up, then we disobey that, right? And you think, well, parents would never do that. Oh, you've not met some of the parents that I have met. I've met some parents who've, uh, in fact, I, I, I remember when I was a youth pastor in 1880, and there was this, this uh, group of young kids that were coming to the church, and there was about five of them, and they were coming on the, the church van. And uh, they were really drawn close to the Lord, and I was trying to get to know them and try to get to know their parents. And one day, all five of them knocked on my, my office door and said, Brother Ryan, we want to talk to you. And they were crying. And they said, um, we have this problem. We're, we're trying to serve the Lord. But every time we go to any store, our parents tell us to go and just stuff our pockets with as much stuff as we can. Just fill our, we, the, mom makes us wear oversized jackets and she'll just, she'll stuff stuff in our jackets and we come out and we've almost been caught so many times and we are so guilty because we have stolen thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of things, but our parents are making us do it. This is the world that we live in and much worse, by the way. So what that tells me is in that kind of situation, You don't obey because to be obedient to that earthly authority would be disobedient to your heavenly authority. We always obey our heavenly authority, amen? We always obey our heavenly authority. And so it is with with wives. Wives are supposed to submit to godly husbands, but if you have an ungodly husband who tells you, you cannot go to church, hello? Now you're in a situation where an earthly authority is telling you to be disobedient to a heavenly authority, and what authority do we always follow? We always follow the heavenly authority no matter what. This is why it's so important who you marry, and it's so important uh, where you direct your love and your attention. Next slide, okay, Esther 2.15. I love the story of Esther, so many powerful things in that story. And Esther teaches us and shows us that godly women are wise and they're teachable. Esther was the daughter of Abihail, who was Mordecai's uncle. Mordecai had adopted his younger cousin, Esther. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, remember, she wasn't the only woman. There were many women, and she was just one. 
she accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. That's the New Living Translation. In other words, Esther was wise enough to have a teachable spirit. She knew that she didn't know everything. She understood that she was in an environment where she didn't have all the answers, and she was willing to be taught by Haggai, and Haggai was able to instruct her and direct her in the ways that would cause her to find favor in the eyes of the king. By the way, this is a beautiful biblical type of a pastor. Haggai is a biblical type of a pastor who teaches us in the ways to be pleasing to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. A godly woman will be teachable. She will listen to the words of her pastor so that she can be pleasing to the king and she will be loved and admired. Did you know that godly women are loved and admired? They just are. Godly women are loved and admired and they find favor, most importantly, they find favor in the eyes of God. My wife has a saying, and if, if you know her, you understand. Uh, if you don't know her, it might sound a little funny to you, but uh, my wife has a, a neat saying, and she'll say, I think that I'm one of God's favorite kids. She'll say that a lot. She said, I just feel like God really, really, really looks out for me. And I know that's true. If you knew her life story, you would know that God really, really, really does love her and look out for her. And that, that's, that's the mindset of a godly woman. A godly woman knows, hey, the king's looking out for me. The king's, the king's taking care of me. How many know the king's taking care of you? The king's looking out for you. Godly women understand that. Next slide, Ruth, another powerful woman of scripture. Ruth chapter two, verse number 17 teaches us that godly women are hardworking and sacrificial. So Ruth gathered barley there all day, and when she beat out the grain that evening, it filled an entire basket. Ruth was sacrificial. She followed her mother-in-law from a strange foreign land into the land of, of promise. Uh, she, she told her mother-in-law, I'm not gonna abandon you in your poverty. Remember, they'd lost their husband, so her mother-in-law was in poverty. Ruth had family in Moab that she could have lived with and been provided for. But Ruth made the decision, I'm going to stay with my godly mother-in-law. I'm gonna follow her to a land that I have never ever been to. And even though I know she's going to get there and be in poverty, it's gonna be a struggle, it's gonna be a hardship. Ruth said, I'll go out and I'll find food for us. I'm gonna take care of you and I'm gonna do everything that I can to be a blessing to this home. She was hardworking and her hardworking sacrificial character caught the attention of Boaz. And that's how Ruth became the mother and the starting line of the lineage of David and eventually Jesus. The lineage of Jesus was a lineage of godly women who were sacrificial and hardworking. This is how you get to someone like Mary who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And Mary was willing to sacrifice in order to give birth to the Messiah. Okay, next slide, Proverbs 31, 11. Proverbs 31, 11 and through verse 12. Godly women are trustworthy and honest. Someone said amen. Godly women are trustworthy and honest. The heart of her husband trusts in her with secure confidence. This is the amplified version. And he will have no lack of gain. She comforts, encourages, and does him only good and not evil all the days of her life. Her husband can trust in her completely because he knows her heart, that she is absolutely trustworthy and completely honest. This is the heart of a godly woman. People don't have to wonder what you're doing. People don't have to worry about whether or not you're doing right. People know and they trust and they rest in that. This brings peace, this brings security, this brings safety into a home when a godly woman is trustworthy in every area of her life and completely honest and godly women will be honest to a fault. Next slide, next slide. I'm moving quickly, 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. I also want the women to dress modestly, everyone said modestly, with decency and propriety. 
adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with what? Good deeds. The King James says good works. Appropriate for women who profess to worship God. I love that wording. Paul is saying women need to dress in a way that is appropriate because anyone can profess to worship God, but women who truly worship God and don't just profess it will dress and conduct themselves in a way that is pleasing and worshipful unto God. And so what is pleasing to God is that a woman, and by the way, let me just pause and say, I know it's Mother's Day, but I'm gonna say to the men, God wants you men to dress modestly as well. God wants men to dress modestly as well. But especially in our culture, and really in every culture, women have been so um, misused and, and treated in a way that is less than dignified to where women feel a pressure to be immodest. Women feel a pressure to be hypersexualized. And women feel a pressure to lose their dignity to fit in in society. And by the way, this pressure, it comes from men that are ungodly. And it comes from women who are ungodly. But God wants women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate things, not with gold, not with pearls, not with jewelry, not with makeup, not, not changing our God-given appearance, but to adorn themselves in a way that is pleasing to God and to have good works, good deeds that are appropriate for women who profess to worship God. How many want to truly worship God in your lifestyle? Really what, what Paul is referring to here is a lifestyle of holiness which is pleasing to God and it's a lifestyle of worship. Friends, worship is more than your dance. Worship is more than your shout. And we need more dancing and we need more shouting. We're not doing enough of it. But it, worship is much more than running the aisles. Worship is how we live. It's how we dress. It's how we talk. It's how we do business. It's how we treat our brothers and our sisters. It, it's, how, it's how we treat pe- strangers. It's how we treat people who are in need. It's how we treat people uh, who can't do anything back for us. I've often said, if you want to know someone's true character, find out what they'll do when no one is looking. Because what people will do when no one is looking is who they really are deep down. So a godly woman understands that living for God is more than just coming to church and lifting their hand. True godliness is a lifestyle where everything that we do is a reflection of our relationship with God. Everything we do is a reflection of our relationship with God. Okay, last slide, and I'm closing with this so we can have a a quick break. Luke 138. Godly women are led by the word. Everyone said the word. Not the world. Godly women are not led by the latest magazine or the latest movie. Godly women are led by the word of God. Luke 1, 38, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me, what? According to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary had a mindset that I'm gonna let my life be led by the word of God and not by the world. If she had been led by the world, she certainly would not have been qualified to raise the Messiah, but she was led by the word. We today are called, women today are called to be led by the word of God, every single word, and let it lead and guide your life and it will lead you and your family. And by the way, I believe that in many ways, women shape the world. They really do. Women shape the world. People say men shape the world, but it's women who shape the men. And so women shape the world. They can change the world. And so when women are godly, it brings, 
It brings something into the world that nothing else can do. Could we just stand and could we just give thanks for all the godly women in our lives? Would you just lift your hand? Maybe you had a godly mother or grandmother or a prayer warrior, someone that loved you, someone that prayed for you. Would you lift your hands and thank God for her right now? Lord, I thank you for every godly woman under the sound of my voice, every mother, every grandmother, every godmother, Lord, every, every woman, Lord, who has taken someone under their wing and loved them and trained them in the ways of righteousness and godliness. I pray that you would bless them today. I pray that they would feel love today. I pray they would feel your touch today. Keep them, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, we have about five minutes, about 15 minutes before we go into to the next service. So you have a few minutes to rest. Find uh, a woman and wish them a very happy Mother's Day. Greet someone and tell them you love them and appreciate them. And we'll be back here at 11 o'clock for family worship. A lot of things happening today, so it's gonna be exciting.